Hello and welcome to another slice of Daily Bread. I'm so glad, once again, that you have joined us today. Joining me today is Pastor James Ash. He will be sharing our devotional with us here today. Pastor James, welcome to Daily Bread. It's great to be back. As we always do, we like to open with uh, a little prayer, asking for God's guidance. So bow your heads. Lord, thank you once again for your your loving watch care over each one of us. And Lord, we're thankful for your precious word. And as we study at sacred pages, Lord, I pray for your spirit to guide us as we study. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's a topic that is frequently referred to in the Bible, but it doesn't very often get talked about today. You don't hear very many sermons or hear Bible studies or or talk about the subject of repentance. But repentance is so crucial. You know, John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Exactly the same words. Peter, on two different sermons, one in Acts chapter 2 and one in Acts chapter 3, he ended his sermon by saying, repent. The apostle Paul said, repent. The John, the revelator, says in five out of the seven different uh, letters to the churches, they have an appeal to repentance. So today I want to talk about repentance because it's important. It's not popular, and so I, I, I'm sorry uh, if it might step on your toes a little bit, but stick with me because I think there's some good news about repentance. Today is going to be part one, repentance, understanding repentance, part one. And to understand this, we're going to be spending most of our time in the Old Testament, but I want to kind of outline why this is such a foundational topic. And to do that, I want to go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So let me take a step back, ask the question, what is Paul talking about? I believe Paul wrote this. What is Paul talking about here in Hebrews? What is, what's his audience going through? Well, Paul is addressing a problem, a serious problem in the church. The Jewish believers that he was writing to in this book of Hebrews were spiritual midgets. You ever seen a spiritual midget or regular a person who was a dwarf or a midget or someone that was, had their growth stunted? Well, there's reasons for that. I worked with a gentleman and he lived in Bangladesh and he wasn't able to get good food. It wasn't his fault, but he wasn't able to get good food when he was growing up and, uh, the, and because of that, he did not grow like he was supposed to. And so he was, he was short and, and, um, and it really showed. But here, Paul is saying, the problem is that there was spiritual, there was a spiritual growth that was stunted in the audience of these, the Hebrew audience. Now notice what it says in chapter 6, Hebrews 6, verse 1 through 3. Paul's going to address this pro problem, and this is what he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So he says, we need to grow on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So what is Paul saying? He says, we need to move forward, not laying again the foundation. Once we've laid the foundation, we need to start building the house. Well, what is that foundation? 
Well, the very first thing that the Apostle Paul says is not laying again the foundation of repentance. Now, there's different foundation uh, the topics, the topics that Paul talks about. The very first topic he talks about is repentance. So now let's turn to the Old Testament. Let's say, where does repentance show up in the Old Testament? Now, if you do a serious word study on the word repentance, you will find that the word repentance comes from the word nakam. Nakam. It's a primitive root to sigh. To sigh or breathe strongly, to be sorry, to lament, to grieve. It also means to change one's mind, to feel compassion, or to comfort. Now I'm not going to study. I'm not going to focus on that. Those last two, to feel compassion or comfort. But today we're going to be looking at to feel sorry, to lament, to grieve, to change one's mind. Now, as we do this, I want to, first of all, whenever we do a study, we need to first look at God. How does this relate to God? How does the topic of repentance relate to God? Here's an important truth, and I want to underscore this. In terms of committing sin, God does not need to repent. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. James chapter 1, verse 13, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, if we go to the Old Testament, I'm going to show something here. It says that God does not repent. But then, strangely enough, you're going to see that God does repent. Well, first of all, let's look at that first part. God does not repent. Numbers 23, verse 19. This is Balaam. Balaam's giving a prophecy. God is not a man that he should lie. Does God tell lies? God only speaks truth, right? God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he not said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make good? So God, whenever God opens his mouth and he speaks, he always speaks the truth. He'll never tell a lie. Notice a similar passage found in 1 Samuel 15, verse 29. And also Samuel of Israel uh, and also the strength, rather, this is speaking of God, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. So God does not lie, and because of that, he doesn't need to repent. But notice something interesting here. I want to give you a second important truth when we talk about repentance. While God does not need to repent of sin, because God does not sin, God does experience the feelings and mental processes associated with repentance, especially as it relates to his interaction with mankind. So because I am made in the image of God, I also am capable of experiencing those same feelings, those same mental processes of repentance. So there are three stages of repentance. I, I kind of put it as a triangle, like three, three sides of a triangle. The first side is sorrow and regret. The second side of the triangle is when a person comes to the point of changing their mind. And then third is the turning action. Sorrow and regret, changing, one, changing one's mind, and a turning action. Let's look at sorrow and regret. This is speaking about God. When God created man and man fell into sin, it got so bad that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, it says, and it repented, or God repented, the, or regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me, that's the King James, or I regret that I have made them. So did God repent? Did he feel regret, remorse? Yes, he did. It must have gotten really bad for God to come to the point where he said, I made a mistake. 
I'm sorry, I, ma I even made man. What about 1 Samuel 15, verse 11 and 35? Well, here again, you find God repenting. God said, it repenteth me, or I am sorry, I regret that I have set up Saul, this is the first king of Israel, Saul, to be king. And verse 35, and the Lord repented, in other words, he was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. So, does God repent? He doesn't repent from sin, because he doesn't sin. But does he feel sorry sometimes for the situation that has occurred? Yes, he does. Job, Job 42, verse 6. Now, Job is, of course, has lost pretty much his, all of his kids, all of his uh, camels, his donkeys, his, his uh, sheep, and uh, his, his life is just in ruins. He says, I abhor myself and repent. This is towards the end as God speaks to him and uh, reveals himself to him. Job says, I abhor myself and repent. In other words, he's feeling grief and sorrow for some of the things that he said. He said some really hard you know, hard things about God because he didn't know what was going on. He says, I repent. Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 8, verse 5 and 6, God said, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearken, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented. Again, no man felt sorry for his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone has turned to his own course, as a horse rusheth into battle. So, the first stage, the first side, is feelings of sorrow and regret. Let's look at the second one, and that is a change of mind. Exodus 13, verse 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people of Israel go, um, let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent, or we would say, change their mind when they see war and they return back to Egypt. Let's look at another example of changing one's mind. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 32, verse 12 and 14. Now the context is Moses interceding for the lives of Israel. Moses is saying, saying, is, is speaking to God. He says, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he, God, bring them out to slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and, Moses uses the word repent. Can you imagine a mere mortal, Moses saying, God, you need to repent. He says, repent, change your mind from this evil. Don't destroy them, change your mind. And the Bible says, the Lord repented. He changed his mind. So the second aspect of repentance is changing one's mind. Let's, in the few minutes that we have left, let's look at the third aspect. And that is a turning action. Joel chapter two, verse 13 and 14. Joel the prophet says, rend your hearts. This is a sorrow for, for sin. Change your mind. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and turn. This is a turning action, right? Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him. He changes his mind. So, Joel is saying, you need to change directions. That is involved with repentance. You need to repent. Repentance is not just a th an aspect of our minds, but it's an aspect of our life. We're heading in this direction. All of a sudden, we have a change of mind, change of heart, and we decide we're going to go in the other direction. And probably one of the best examples of this is the story of Jonah. God told Jonah to go and to give a warning to Nineveh because God was going to destroy Nineveh. And so the people, when, when Jonah finally arrives in Nineveh and he begins preaching, 
Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 3, verse 6, and I'm going to read here verse 6 through 10 because you're going to hear about repentance, right? The people of Nineveh believed God. What does that mean? That they changed their mind. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. That's grieving and sorrow for sin, right? And from the greatest of them, even to the least of them, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He laid his robe from him. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Again, a sign of grieving and of sorrow. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, no food. Let them not be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily, cry out unto God. Yea, let them turn. This is the turning action, right? The third level of repentance. Let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And who can tell if God will turn and repent? Huh. He says, look, if we repent and we turn back to God, maybe, just maybe, God will repent and turn back to us. Sat, I don't know about you, but as I did this study on repentance, I, and I saw these three levels, like the triangle of repentance. Let's go over that again. The triangle of repentance, the first first level of repentance is a sorrow and a regret for sin and what sin has done. Number two is to change one's mind and number three is a turning action. When we come to that level and we turn to God, God will have mercy and He will turn to us. Why don't we do that right now? Why don't we turn to God in prayer? Let's repent. And perhaps you have something in your life. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. And you need to repent. You need to express sorrow and regret for that. You need to change directions in the way that you think about it. And then finally, you need to, by God's power and by God's grace, turn away from that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, Repentance is the foundation of the Christian experience. And we cannot come to Christ Jesus unless we repent. The Bible says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if ever that was a message that needed to be proclaimed, it is today. It was the message before Jesus came the first time. It will also be the message that will be proclaimed before Jesus comes the second time. So give us the gift of repentance today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor James, thank you so much for sharing today's devotional. It was my pleasure. You know, here at Daily Bread, as always, we want to leave you with a promise that comes from God's Word. And today's promise comes to us from Psalm 121 and verse number 7. It says, The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. What a wonderful promise to know that God is out there and He wants to protect each one of us. You know, there's lots more promises that can be found in God's Word, and I encourage you, as always, to pick up God's Word, spend some time reading and studying its sacred pages today. Thank you for joining us for Daily Bread. I hope you were blessed, and I hope to see you again tomorrow. Until then, so long.